from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Robert Saladini, and it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to the talk today by Annette Gordon-Reed, who is discussing her latest book, The Hemingses of Monticello, an American Family. The relationship between Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings has been a subject of speculation for centuries, even more so in the past decade, perhaps as a result of today's speaker's 1997 book, that uh, carefully evaluated claims and counterclaims about the Jefferson Hemings relationship and when DNA testing increased evidence of a sexual liaison between them. In her latest book, Annette Gordon Reed chronicles the Hemings family from the mid 1700s when an English sea captain fathered a child by an enslaved woman living near Williamsburg, Virginia, to the early 19th century story of Sally Hemings. Marie Morgan and Edmund Morgan writing in the most recent New York Review of Books calls this book brilliant. I should also pause here and state that uh, Annette's earlier book was also described as brilliant by the New Yorker. Uh, and it, uh, they continue to say that uh, it marks Annette Gordon-Reed as one of the most astute, insightful, and fort forthright historians of this generation. This sentiment is echoed by the winner of the 2006 John W. Kluge Prize for Lifetime Achievement in the Study of Humanity and a great friend of ours here at the Library of Congress, Dr. John Hope Franklin, author of From Slavery to Freedom, who said that this is not only a riveting history of a slave family on a grand scale, it is also a rarely seen portrait of the family in the big house with a remarkable account of the relationship of white and black families. This work catapults Gordon Reed into the very first rank of historians of slavery. If Dr. Franklin says this, it's got to be true. A native of Texas, Annette Gordon Reed is a professor of law at New York Law School. In addition to her 1997 book titled Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings in American Controversy, she's written several other books. With Vernon Jordan, she wrote Vernon Ken Reed, a memoir back in 2001. Um, and in 2002, Race on Trial, Law and Justice in American History. In this book, she edits 12 original essays that illustrate how race often determined the outcome of trials and how trials that confront issues of racism provide a unique lens on American cultural history. We're in for a very special treat today. So I hope you join me in welcoming our speaker, Annette Gordon-Reed. Thank you very much for that very generous introduction. I'm very happy to be here. This is sort of a return visit for me. A few years back, I was on the advisory committee um, commemorating um, the anniversary of the uh, Library of Congress, the birth of it, with Jefferson um, selling his books to the library after the British had destroyed the Capitol and um, destroyed Washington during the War of 1812. So it's always nice to be back here and see sort of familiar um, faces and familiar haunts in this building. Uh, I thought I would talk a little bit about the book. This is the occasion for us getting together to explain a little bit how I came to this point and what it is that I'm trying to accomplish in the book. Um, Robert mentioned my first book, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, an American Controversy, that came out um, uh, 1997. I was shooting as hard as I could for sort of a 10-year anniversary, uh, but, you know, books don't always work out exactly the way you want them to when you're working on them, so I was a year late with it. Um, I guess I could make it the anniversary of the paperback of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings and, and sit and sort of satisfy myself this way. But for people who know anything about me and know anything about my work know that Jefferson has been a long-standing interest for me. Um, I started writing the book, um, well actually I started thinking about Jefferson when I was a child, um, reading a biography of him, 
as a third grader, sort of a biography that was geared to people my age. Um, nothing about the Hemings is in that uh, story. Um, basically the kind of thing that you would expect uh, that would teach young people about the great people who existed in their country. Jefferson, Madison, Booker T. Washington, George Washington Carver, there was Dolly Madison. But Jefferson's biography interested me the most because I identified with his love of books. Um, there were other things about him, obviously, that were quite different than me. I'm male, I mean, he's male, I'm female, um, he's white and I'm black. But this love of books, this love of learning was something that I keyed in on when I was reading this biography, and I continued to be interested in him over the years. I didn't find out about Sally Hemings and her family um, until I was a teenager and read a copy of my parents' book, Quite Over Black, that was written by Winthrop Jordan, and he has a chapter in there when he, that's called Thomas Jefferson Self and Society. And that's the first time I read anything at all about the Hemings family. Then the next experience that I had with it was writing or actually reading Fawn Brody's biography of Jefferson, very controversial biography that came out in 1974, in which she wrote about Jefferson's life and included the Hemings family as sort of the Hemings story, the story that Jefferson had a long-term liaison with an enslaved woman, sort of included it as part of Jefferson's biography. And that caused a firestorm of controversy, obviously, if people remember that, and she was a somewhat embattled figure. But what really interested me about that book was at the back of it, there were two recollections of enslaved people. Madison Hemings, who said that he was the son of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, and a man named Israel Jefferson, whose real last name was Gillette. In my book, he appears as Israel Gillette because that was his true family name. Jefferson was sort of appended onto his name, uh, and he is known as Israel Jefferson, but uh, instead of his, of his real name. And Israel Gillette talked about Monticello and also talked about a relationship between Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. And I found it fascinating to think about the possibility or the prospect of being, your, being owned by your father. Now, I grew up, as, as Robert mentioned, I grew up in Texas. And Texas was, people don't think of Texas as the South, but it, it is the South. And East Texas is the South. Any place, I say, where they grew cotton and had slaves is part of the South. So that kind of thing I knew even as a young age was not a far-fetched story. It wasn't that I believed it or disbelieved it, but I never encountered it or perceived it as something crazy because I knew that this was kind of thing happened. If you go to a family reunion, a black family reunion, the people in the family there will be all different colors of the rainbow. And typically it's not uncommon at all for the older people to be more fair-skinned than the younger people, because people back off in those little towns and those places back in those time periods mixed. So for as a Southerner viewing this, it never struck me as an odd story. I knew it was odd to people because of Jefferson's prominence, what he meant to people, but that has nothing to do with evidence. I mean, it's sort of like thinking that your birthday matters to the lottery, the numbers in the lottery. It means something to you but it doesn't mean anything to the way the numbers fall. So how you feel about Jefferson or how people felt about Jefferson even you know, doesn't really determine what actually happened in the past. So I kept interested in this subject, decided to go to um, law school instead of becoming a historian because I thought or was told at the time that there were too many historians. What they didn't tell me is that there are not many black historians, PhDs, and people would have been happy for me to not go to law school <laughs> and go into history, but alack and alas, um, I went to law school, and you know I'm not regretting it. It was it was a good choice for me, and I said, well, I can continue to indulge my love of history. If you love books, that's the great thing about books. You can always have books. You know, you don't have to be part of any formal program or anything like that to love and to read books and to learn from them. So, I started. I kept reading history and at some point started to think, yes, but I also like to write as well. And that's kind of hard to do if you're an associate in a law firm. Um, you're supposed to be writing what people tell you to write, not your own stuff. Uh, and I became much more frustrated with um, just reading history and not doing the kind of thing that I thought I was really supposed to do. And one day in 1995, or actually one month, I began to see articles about a movie that was going to be made, a movie called Jefferson in Paris. Um, if people have seen it, it's not a very good movie. I, I don't think we can talk about that later. But, um, and 
I started seeing articles about people being outraged at the possibility that they were going to treat this story as true. You know, the story that Jefferson had this liaison. And people were saying things like, Jefferson wouldn't be involved with a slave girl. Or there's no evidence that Jefferson was involved with Sally Hemings. Well, a slave girl, um, that kind of ticked me off because it sort of implies that every African-American woman from 1619 to 1865 was the same woman, a slave girl, and you know exactly what she was like and what she was supposed to be. And this sort of dismissal of the idea that there were different types of people, as many different personalities, as many different um, kinds of, of, of um, of sort of perspectives and experiences um, that I know existed in slavery, that was sort of shunted to the side. I was also concerned about the idea that there was no evidence. Now, evidence is not the same thing as proof, but I knew that Madison Hemings's recollections and Israel Gillette's recollections and the oral history of the family. Madison Hemings is not properly seen as oral history because he lived at the time. Oral history usually refers to things further down the line, but those two things to me, the oral history and this primary history that Madison Hemings gives about his life at Monticello, I knew that that was evidence. People may not be convinced about it, but to say that there was no evidence to me was like saying he never spoke. And I found that quite offensive. If you think about someone who lived as a slave, if you think about people, any group of people who are living under a system of oppression, whether they're behind the Iron Curtain, on the Gulag, or Nazi Germany, or anything, the idea that somebody could come out of that system and say, here's what happened to me, and people would treat it as if it were meaningless, struck me as not only intellectually unsound, but it was immoral in a way. There was a moral aspect to this that um, really sort of fired me up, and I sat down to write an op-ed piece that got longer and longer and longer and turned into my first book. <laughs> and after the, as I was writing the book, I thought at this point, I didn't tell anybody I was writing a book. I'm a law professor. I'm actually a professor of history now, too, at Rutgers. But law professors are supposed to be writing law review articles. So I didn't tell anybody I was writing a book. Um, I wrote the book. And as I did so, I thought, you know, I could do what I've really always wanted to do, and that is write a biography of Jefferson. And that is the next big thing on, on the table right now for me. But I also thought, you know, there are lots of records about the Hemingses here. Jefferson, as p many of the people in this room know, was an inveterate record keeper, uh, not only uh, in terms of writing things down in letters, but in the farm book, um, his memorandum books that was edited by James Bear and Cinder Stanton, Lucia Stanton at Monticello. Um, I think the greatest work of Jefferson scholarship in, in decades. It's the most useful thing um, that, that has come down the pike. Um, those kinds of records say a lot about the Hemingses. And in this book, at one point I write about Jefferson uh, in New York with James and Robert Hemings, and Jefferson in Philadelphia with James Hemings. And you can pretty much track what James Hemings and Robert are doing every day from Jefferson's memorandum books, gave this amount of money to Robert to go do this and that and the other. And from the letters and the memorandum book, you can piece together a picture of a life of individual enslaved people in ways that you just can't otherwise. I mean, this is, we know more about this family than you know about not just other enslaved people, but white people who lived in the 19th, uh, 18th and 19th century. So I, as I was writing the first book, I thought, well, here's an opportunity to write about um, uh, slaves and slave people in a different sort of way. Um, one of the things I say in the book is that for African Americans, social history trumps biography. People see blacks and enslaved people, and I really do think the way people see blacks today is very much influenced by slavery, how they were viewed in slavery. And it's sort of a group identity. You, you determine what is going on in a black person's life by looking at what's happening to the majority of black people. You don't really do that with white people. Certainly biographers don't do that. You may get the context, the larger context that the person is living in, but you sort of write from the inside out as much as you possibly can, rather than saying, okay, what's happening to this group of black people? This is likely what's happening to that one. And what I wanted to do here was to use the information from Jefferson's records, um, from the oral history of the Hemings family, some of the written record of the Hemings family, some of the members of the family were literate, um, to try to piece together, to try to do for them 
what is often done for other whites in history, and that is to give them an individual story. I think um, dealing with people, dealing, dealing with abstractions is tough for people. It's tough to relate to a concept, uh, enslaved black person, enslaved black woman. But if you write about Sally Hemings or Elizabeth Hemings or James Hemings, and you see James Hemings who starts out in the book uh, as a, a young boy who is capturing mockingbirds for Jefferson. When Jefferson is courting his wife, he mentions in his memorandum book, I gave Jamie this much amount of money, this amount of money for capturing a mockingbird uh, for me. Then you see James go to become a teenager who is in Richmond when Jefferson decides that he's gonna go to Paris. And Jefferson doesn't really know where he is, so he writes to William Short and says, if you can find James, um, tell him to meet me in Philadelphia. We're going to France. Um, Jefferson has the idea that he's going to turn him into a chef, which he actually does. So we see a young boy, and you see him as a teenager, you see him um, in France as a young man, learning um, a skill, becoming a professional chef. It's not an insignificant thing to have happen. I mean, how many uh, people in America, how many Virginians, white or black, went overseas and lived in a francophone, you know, francophone country for over five years, who learned a trade in that, a profession in that place, who worked with other French people to sort of bring that out. So you see him sort of progress through life um, to the point where he's back in America with Jefferson, uh, then becomes a free man, travels around in the United States, travels back overseas, and unfortunately ends, his life ends tragically as a suicide. Um, there's a person here. There's not a concept of enslaved black man um, that is sort of a distancing thing, a thing that you can make someone somewhat an object of pity, but I, what I want these people to be um, are sort of are p the kind of people that you empathize with. Empathy requires some degree of connection to the person, and pity, you can sort of put the person over there, and, and it's not really like you. Empathizing with enslaved people, I think it's just another, again, it's not the only way to do things. I'm, I never understood people who think that it's either this or it's either that. You're writing the social history and only that, or you're writing the biography. It's all kinds of things. If we're really going to get a handle on this part of our history, you have to look at all different facets and use all different types of methodology. And what I'm trying to do here is to personalize the story of slavery so that people can get at it that way. I, this is driven home to me um, very forcefully. Uh, a couple of summers ago, I was sitting there Sunday afternoon, <laughs> this is so pathetic, typing away uh, on this book and coming to a section about um, Mary Hemings, who was Sally Hemings' oldest sister, who, when Jefferson goes to Paris, is leased out to a man named Thomas Bell. And they began a relationship um, they have two children. When Jefferson comes back, she asks Jefferson to sell her to Thomas Bell. This is, I mean, this is slavery and property. Think of someone being leased, the idea of leasing a person to someone. He comes back, she asks him to sell her to, uh, to Thomas Bell, which Jefferson agrees to do, but he agrees to, but he apparently sell, is only uh, amenable to selling her um, two youngest children, the two children that she's had with Thomas Bell, not her older children. And so I'm sort of writing there, and I said, well, you know, the older ones, two of her children had already been given away as wedding presents, and the next two uh, were living with her at, at Monticello before uh, she moves in with Bell. And their names are Joseph Fawcett and um, uh, Joseph and Betsy. And I say, well, you know, these two young children were left at Monticello. They were probably looked after by their aunts and uncles, their extended family. And I said, but Betsy wasn't very old. You know, she was nine. And all of a sudden, I'm st sitting there being this very detached scholar, and I start to cry. Not like tears rolling down your cheek, sort of silent crying. I mean, like, really crying. Because there are moments when it hits you. I've, I have two children, and I've had nine-year-olds, and I know what it would be like for them if they were separated from me. Now, Mary Hemings lived not far from Monticello. She lived in Charlottesville, um, and so there was a lot of traffic between Charlottesville and the mountain, but lots of other people were, were not so even that fortunate. You know, they never saw their parents again when they were sold. And so there are these moments 
uh, like that when you think of these people, not just in terms of, you know, as lives in the past or, as I said, a generic enslaved person. You know their names and you know their relationships and you know their connections to people and what they mean to one another. The book, at the beginning of the book, I have, it's a very big family, so the, the first part of the family tree is in the front of the book and the next part of it is in the, in the back of the book. And you can see the naming patterns. They're naming each other after one another. How do people who don't have the legal ability to form a family, how do they keep that together? And one of the ways they kept it together was by naming one another after their siblings, after their mothers. Um, there are many Sarah, Sa Sally Hemings' name was Sarah. Um, there are many Sarahs um, in that group, Marys, Elizabeths, Martins, Jameses, all the different generations. And that's how people kept, kept things together. And I, I felt as I was writing my first book, and as I said, looking at all this information, that I could try to illuminate another aspect of slavery by coming at it from a different way, not just the group identity, but the individual identity. So I sat down and started to write. I mean, I typically, I mean, some people sort of jump back and forth. I've heard in the types of, in their writing, the different periods of time. I generally start, the first thing that I start writing is the, and, and I just kind of go through to the end. I don't really skip um, in, in chronology or anything. So I sat down and started with a preface talking about my looking at the, looking at the farm book, the original farm book at the Massachusetts Historical Society. And I go from there. The first section of the book, it's a very long book, um, but people have told me it's readable. Um, a long book um, divided into three parts. The first part is called Origins, and that really sets up the Hemings family. We start with Elizabeth Hemings, the matriarch of the clan, who is born in 1735 um, to an English ship captain and um, an African woman. Um, she is owned by a prominent family in Virginia called the Epses. Uh, Frances Epps is her owner, and Frances Epps has a daughter, a legal daughter, Martha, who grows up to marry a man named John Wales, who is Jefferson's, who will become Jefferson's father-in-law. John Wales um, marries, as I said, marries uh, Martha Epps, has his own daughter, Martha, then has two other wives, and as was often the case in those days, buried two more wives. He had three wives. Uh, after the third time, I guess he decided he did not want to get married again, um, and he took Elizabeth Hemings as a concubine, uh, Sally Hemings' mother, and had six children with her, the youngest of whom was Sally, born in 1773, the year he died. Um, John Wells, a fascinating figure. Uh, I include in the Hemings family the white men who had children with Hemings women, so I did a lot of research on John Wales. I got the, it gave me an excuse to go to England and go to Lancashire and actually work with a genealogist to trace his family uh, line down. Fascinating story about him. In my first book, I describe him as a lawyer trained in England because relying on Tyler's Quarterly or one of those old magazines, that's what they said, you know, right? So it, he was a lawyer, it sounded plausible to me. Uh, he actually was a servant boy who was brought over by a man named Philip Ludwell. Uh, in the late 1730s, who and this man helped raise him up, you know, gave him money, helped educate him. He was evidently a very, very smart and creative uh, man. Uh, and I thought that was fascinating because it's sort of the difference between being, uh, for Martha Jefferson, Jefferson's wife, the daughter of a man who was trained as a lawyer in England, which would point to at least a middle or an upper class background. I mean, there were some farmers' sons who did become, who did go to the law, didn't typically become, um, um, you know, barristers or the sort of the people who argued in court. Um, but the difference between that and being a former servant boy, I think, was is, is quite a bit there, and it, it makes. A lot of the things about Jefferson, in Jefferson's autobiography, he has this very famous quote where he sort of disparages people who say that they can trace their ancestry back, far back in England and Scotland and let anybody make of that what they will, which was basically saying, I don't make anything of it. People typically say, well, that is really a slap at his mother because his mother was a member of the Randolph family that was more prominent than the Jeffersons, and maybe this is some sort of tension between him and his mother. But if you know that his father-in-law was a servant boy, he knows that his children are one generation from a servant. So, you know, John Wells is sort of a, 
I looked as much as I could through the family records to try to figure out who he was, but he really is pretty much John Wales, born in Lancaster the day that he was born, and that's pretty much it. No tracing back his ancestry back in, into England. So the first part of the book, start with Elizabeth Hemings, John Wales, introduce Thomas Jefferson, um, talk a little bit about blacks in the revolution and the Hemings' experiences there. Some of them were captured and taken to, to Yorktown um, with a number of other people, enslaved people, who decided to go on their own uh, to, join the jo to join the British forces. Uh, Martin Hemings, who has an encounter with the British at Monticello after Jefferson has left Monticello when Tarleton's troops are coming to capture him. Um, and go from there to talk about life at Monticello, and then ends, the first section ends with the death of Martha Jefferson, which was a, catac excuse, Mar yeah, was a cataclysmic uh, event for Thomas Jefferson, um, and really begins the sort of change in the Hemings family's life, because he decides at that point that he's going to accept a commission to go to France, which he had rejected a couple of times before because Martha was too ill, and he goes to Paris, takes James Hemings with him, and leaves the rest, and obviously the other Hemingses stay behind. Martin and Robert sort of go off and hire themselves out and work for wages. Some of the Hemings women are, are rented, at, rented out as housekeepers. Most of them stay at Monticello. So this is the beginning of a change for the family. Jefferson, we think of Jefferson at Monticello all the time, but Jefferson, after his wife's death, between 1783 and until the time he comes back in retirement in 1794, he's really not there. And then he's in retirement for a couple of years and then goes back into public life. He's really not a permanent fixture at Monticello until his retirement years. Um, so this is the, the beginning of that, that process and it changes the nature of life for Hemings. And so we end that section and I take them to France and most of that section is about James Hemings and Sally Hemings in Paris, um, finding out about their lives there. They were on what would technically be considered free soil. There was supposed to be no slavery in France. The French didn't mind slavery so long as it was in the colonies. They just did not want it on French soil proper. And so they would have had to file a petition, but hundreds of people filed petitions in the 18th century for freedom, and every one of them was granted. And there was a big, there was a greater number, too, of people, of masters who just freed their slaves on their own because they knew what would happen if they actually went to the Admiralty Court and asked for their freedom. So James and Sally Hemings could have remained in France. They were, James Hemings was trained as a chef, as I said before. He was drawing a, a decent salary, and Sally Hemings was as well, uh, wages. Wages above the norm for French servants. And Jefferson paid everybody once a month, which they didn't do in France. In France, you got paid once a year if you were a servant, um, and it was, you got paid at the time you left your servant. You did a year's contract or six month contract, and then you got paid. And you know, payment in a year is hypothetical payment, right? I mean, you would get paid or not, and a lot of times people weren't. He followed the American rule of paying them every single month. So here are two young people who are enslaved in Virginia who get used to getting wages and managing money and having something that was their own and getting paid, as I said, above the norm for people uh, who, who, and for French servants. Um, they're, they're in Paris um, for these years. Um, Sally Hemings, at the Madison Hemings' recollections are, in his recollections say that there was a conflict about coming home, that Sally Hemings didn't want to come home. And I don't want to be sexist about this, but I find it very hard to believe that this was just her doing. Her brother is 24. He, at, at near the end of his stay, hired a tutor to teach him proper French grammar which I don't think he would have done. I mean, this seems to be in preparation for staying there. Um, Jefferson persuades them to come home, which they do, and the, the scene shifts then to the third section, which is called On the Mountain, and then I sort of, which is technically not right because, as I said, Jefferson's not there very much, but it's about the life of, of uh, James Hemings, um, in Philadelphia with Jefferson and some of his travels and so forth, and then pick up Sally Hemings and her children and other members of the Hemings family who become a focus. John Hemings, who was the master artisan there. If you go to Monticello now, you can still see some of his work uh, furniture 
um, and Floris E. Laid and so forth, Joseph Fawcett, who was a blacksmith, and I followed them through to the cataclysm <laughs> at the end when Jefferson um, dies $107,000 in debt. $107,000 in 1826 is a lot of money, uh, millions of dollars. Uh, and all of the people, except for the Hemingses, he frees five people in his will. Um, he frees people, his family, freed people informally uh, as well. The rest of the Hemingses, the Hemings, Sally Hemings' sisters and brothers end up as free people. We don't know how. There's no formal emancipation of these people, but the Hemings Wales children is what I call them in the book. Um, Thenia dies in 1795, but the, all the rest of them end up as free people somehow, appearing in the census in the 1830 census as free people. Sally Hemings appears in a special census in 1833 as a free mulatto woman who has lived in Charlottesville since 1826, the year Jefferson died. And it was a special census done to go around and ask black people if they wanted to go back to Africa. Um, Sally Hemings, who's like a quarter black, I mean, it would have made more sense to send her back to Surrey, England, um, to say, you know, <laughs> do you want to go back to Africa? And she says, no, I don't want to go back to Africa. Um, and I follow, and so that's her story. That I go along with her line, but also the, the book ends with the story of Joseph Fawcett, who was a grandson of Elizabeth Hemings, as I said, who was an artisan, who was a, the blacksmith at Monticello, who is freed in Jefferson's will, but his wife and his children were not. And so he spent the next decades trying to buy them all back. What he did was he asked whites in the community to buy his children with the promise that he would buy them when he got the money. And he did that on a number of occasions, but there was one man who would not sell his 11-year-old son back to him, uh, even though he had the money uh, to purchase him. He just refused to do it. And he hung on as long as he could, and finally they went to Ohio in the 1840s because Virginia was getting too hard for blacks. After Nat Turner, it was a real crackdown on, on enslaved people there and blacks in general. Um, it has something of a happy ending because later in the other decades, Peter makes it to freedom, makes it out to Cincinnati and joins his father uh, and, and mother and siblings as an adult. Um, they become very active in the Underground Railroad and Peter becomes a caterer and a minister. And when he dies, there are big obituaries of him in Cincinnati. So it, it's this horrible story of, of a family dispersed. I mean, you know, people talk about Sally Hemings and they think about, oh, you know, th is this the story of, of this terrible thing happened to this woman, you know, being raped for all these years by Thomas. I mean, you know, however people construct this, but the real tragedy, there are really serious, serious stories uh, that, and things that happened to other members of the Hemings family that I really think ought to be, and the Fawcett story is one in particular that ought to be told and to get people to focus on uh, in addition to talking about Tom and Sally. So that is the book in a nutshell. Um, I really um, have been heartened by the reception so far. Uh, we'll see what happens as we go along down the road. But my main point, as always, as I said before, was to, to try to get people to think about these people who, uh, think about them in a different way. Uh, we are who we are today in large measure by what happened during these times. And I, I really do think if you can be honest and forthright about that, and readable, um, you, you stand a chance of maybe not solving all the problems, but at least having some understanding of how we got to be where we are today. The good things and the bad things, by the way, um, are contained in all of this. So that's the book, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about my work, this book, or Mr. Jordan, or anything else that you come, on, come up with. Thank you very much. I think he's got a microphone. He has a microphone. I think he's gonna dart around the room. Is that the idea? Did I, does this go off? Can people hear me? Okay, great, I seem to be going in and out, sorry. Hello, uh, thank you for your talk. My name is Luis Clavel, and I work here at the Library of Congress. Um, I'm really interested in the subtitles for your works, An American Family, An American Controversy. It seems like a great opportunity to define American um, as an African American. I, uh, I read in the paper about maybe seven years ago that the first African American had gone, um, well, the first African had traveled to outer space. 
And uh, this person was a white South African. Mm -hmm. And when white South Africans come to America, they are African Americans. Yeah. So uh, when we really think about the American experience, uh, this experience with the Hemings and um, what has happened uh, through our uh, experience as captive Africans um, in a peculiar and extreme form of capitalism uh, that we easily call slavery, um, somehow we need to define it in a more particular way um, so that we can see that uh, these connections with Native Americans, uh, with Europeans uh, and Africans has really created an African family, I mean, or an American family, mm -hmm. or an American uh, grouping of people uh, that by a historical experience defines us in a unique way. Um, and through this unique historical and migratory experience, uh, we are actually a little more than black Americans or African Americans. Uh, but almost the definition of American. And I just wanted to have your thoughts on that. Well, it's, it's sort of interesting you would say that. James Baldwin had um, an interesting quote. He, he said that if, if black Americans, if blacks aren't Americans, there are no Americans. And, and that's sorely what you're sort of driving at there. Um, the beginning of the book, I didn't talk as much about um, uh, Elizabeth Hemings, starts with Virginia in the 1730s. And one of the, if you go to Colonial Williamsburg and you walk around, I mean, it's very hard to recreate what it was actually like because for obvious reasons, black people have no interest in dressing up as slaves and walking around Williamsburg to try to give people the authentic experience, you know? I mean, there's only so far people are willing to go. But Williamsburg, the area where Elizabeth Hemings was born, was a place of English people and African people. I mean, with a smattering of other ethnic, European ethnic groups in there, but we're talking almost half and half. And the 1730s, more, more Africans were brought into Virginia during the 1730s than in any other part in American history. So, and more Africans came to America before the 1800s than whites, brought over obviously as, as enslaved people. So this notion of, of American and whiteness. Whiteness is the sort of elemental definition of American. Can't really hold just by the numbers. They don't. They don't hold. Um, the Native Americans. I don't really get as much into the Native American situation uh, in the first part of the book uh, as I do black and white because I'm focusing in on uh, focusing in on this family. But that's really that's really an essential thing to understand, and it's very hard to conceptualize. I mean, if you go to Williamsburg and you see that that film that they have running in a loop. Uh, I think it was made in the 50s or something like that. Um, and it's, it's a white place. But Williamsburg was not just a white place. It was, it was a white place and a black place and, and a red place. Unfortunately, not much of a red place because they were sort of gone by then. I mean, more to more, you know, they were more in the western part. Uh, a number of them died off and run off of, uh, of their land. But this is, we think of America as a global society now, but slavery made the world global at that time period. So there is this interesting mixture, this, this way of defining America that, is, that has to be broadened much more so than you know, just the first English settlers in, in the country. And you don't, deval you don't say that these people don't count because they were enslaved people, because they influenced the language, the culture. I mean, Europeans always say white Americans walk like Black people was it? Carl Jung said white Americans walk like Negroes. That was his. I mean, from a European perspective, we have been we've become something else. And certainly, Africans, people from the African continent, don't look at African Americans as being just, first place. There's Africa is so diverse. Uh, so how could you possibly represent all the diversity of that country? Europeans and Africans know that we are something different than they, and we have made something different here through a lot of you know tragedy and struggle and turmoil, but you're right, it ha it's a, it, there's a uniqueness about the American experience that isn't encapsulated in just one ethnic group. Hi, my name is Karima Hurt. I work at the United States Capitol. I have a two-part question. I would like to know if any of the people on Sally Hemmings' father's side, the Wales, is, am I pronouncing the last name correctly, if they acknowledge or accept any of the Hemmings and uh, want to be a part of her heritage in connection with the president. 
And secondly, the property of Monticello, do they invite you to spread this information about the Hemans in detail? Are they more willing and accepting nowadays? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, well, I'll, I'll answer it. Well, I'll go chronolog chronologically as you asked it. I don't, I don't know about the whales. It would be interesting because, you know, Lancaster is pretty far away. And um, I, I think, um, I don't know that they know anything about it. I'm actually going to be doing, I'm going to be in Oxford in February, and I'm going to be doing some events. Norton there will be setting up events, probably some events in Lancaster. It'll be interesting to see if anybody comes out, right? Because uh, it'll be, you know, hey, we didn't know anything about this. But it's, it's fascinating because John Wales is clearly reproducing the names of his family in his, from L Lancaster in his family here. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what turns up. Um, I go to Monticello all the time. I'm on the um, advisory group of the International Center of Jefferson Studies and also the advi African American advisory group there. So I have these two organizations that require me to be there for their meetings periodically during the year. And I go there for research. Uh, we have technically, no, you guys are a launch as well, but technically the book launch is supposed to be Friday at Monticello. So I'll, I will be speaking there. And um, Monticello, I mean, the, the, the Thomas Jefferson Foundation is separate from the Family Association, uh, which you may have read something about in terms of the controversy about whether or not the Hemingses could be buried in the cemetery, which no Hemings, as far as I know, wants to. This is a controversy between the family, the legal, Jefferson's legal white family. Uh, so the foundation is very, very separate from it. And they're doing an amazing job, not just in terms of talking about the Hemings story, but talking about slavery. Because it's a plantation. It's, it's easy to forget that when you go there. It's so beautiful, right? It's like, a, you can, I could do this. You know, <laughs> no. Um, you know, easily. It's a gorgeous place, but a place that he never saw it look like, right? Uh, they keep that place, you know, right up to, to snuff with everything. Um, but they are very committed to the idea of talking about slavery. Not, you know, not Tom and Sally, but slavery, that this, is a work, this was a working plantation. Um, and here are the people who, who work there, and here's the family that own people. So they, they're melding the story there. So there hasn't been any problem at all uh, with me being there and talking about this and arguing about this or whatever. Come down, well, he's going to be fine. So, Reed, um, I'm curious, you mentioned that, that movie, um, Jefferson in Paris, and my recollection is the implication is that the spark occurred in Paris uh, with a 14 year old, is that right? Something like 16. that? 16. 16. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you mentioned uh, you did a lot of reading of these meticulous records and uh, also the distinction between evidence and proof. Mm -hmm. Did you find evidence, if not proof, or did you develop any theories about when this relationship might have started time-wise um, and where? Actually, I mean, it is my belief, Ma Madison Hemings said, the part that I left out in the chronology here, is that his mother was pregnant when she came back from Paris, and that was one of the things that concerned her is that she did not want to have a child who would be an enslaved person. And he says that Jefferson problem, promised her that her children would be freed. The, I talk about this in a book, in the, in the book, in a chapter called Equilibrium. Uh, and I talk about indications that Sally Hemings had a baby in 1790 from, Je from letters between, Matt, between Martha Jefferson and um, Betsy Epps, um, Hemings's would have been Hemings' half-sister. So it's really from working from what happened in 1790, the letters in which he writes when Martha says, you know, I need a new maid. Um, and what happened to Sally? Um, and Jefferson says, well, I will give you a maid. And he gives her Mary Hemings' daughter, Molly, at this point. So then you think, well, what, what happened to Sally? Sally was your maid two months ago, what the heck happened now? They don't really talk about it. That letter is no longer extant, by the way. Um, there's, Jefferson makes reference to it in his letter. The actual letter that Martha writes to him is, is, is with a lot of his letters. I mean, you know, it's amazing that we have as many of them as we do. So there's a whole chapter that I go through and talk about the correspondence between them that indicates that something happened, that she sort of disappears from this family after 1790. Um, you write about People write about her sisters, they write about her brothers,
But here was a person who was at the heart of this family that just sort of disappears off the radar screen after 1790. So there is a chapter, and I, outlay, I lay out all of this uh, information about 1790 and what happens with Sally Hemings when she comes back. Um, the, 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 you know, I did a talk for, the, um, for my children's school, middle school, and they were, well, they were sixth graders, and I was thinking, you know, well, how am I gonna talk about this to sixth graders, right? You know what? So I get there and I sit down, and they're like, I don't know how anybody calls this an affair. An affair is when you're married to somebody and you're having sex with somebody else. I mean, they started saying all this stuff, and I was like, <laughs> I was trying to be circumspect, and they were, you know, just sort of running along with this. And, and I said, well, okay. And they said, well, what's the problem with this? I said, well, you know, she was an African-American person. She's black and he's white. Well, they didn't really get that. And I said, well, you know, he's a, a slave master. He has power over this person. You know, how can, you know, that's, that's an issue here. How do you have consent if this person has power? And they said, well, but if you own somebody, if you can make them work, why can't, I mean, so that really didn't get them. And then they asked me, they said, well, how old was she? And I said, she was about 16. And then they went, oh. Because they could, they, we could see them totaling up the years. Well, I'm in middle school. That would mean that blah, 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 blah. And that was the one that gave them real pause. And I talk in the book about, I mean, 16 is young. But there is a whole section in, in the book I talk about James Madison, who falls in love with a girl who's named Catherine Floyd when she's 15. And he, is, he wants to marry her. And Jefferson is sort of like the matchmaker. With, you know, Madison's 33. This girl is 15 years old. Uh, he met her when she was 12. Uh, they lived in the, the same rooming house. And I say, you know, out of respect for Madison, we can never know when he first became interested in her. And, you know, just know that by the time she's 15, he, he wants to marry her. I mean, there's the age of consent in Virginia in um, the 18th century was 10. Uh, it was raised to 12 in 1824. Um, and they were being progressive, right? Um, there was a different understanding about age. You know, women, we, women postpone marriage now because they go to college. They do all these kinds of things. But if you, women, what did women do in those days, well, according to men? What were they supposed to do but have babies, get married and have babies? And you don't wait to do that. Um, so, no, but that's a real, that's a real issue for people. Um, the age here, uh, the question of, of Jefferson um, being involved with somebody who's 16. But I, I sort of go through the list of people in his life who were married to his one of his childhood friends, Thomas Mann Randolph, at 50, marries a girl named Gabriella Harvey when she's 17. Um, and, you know, it's, this is a different, different world. So I do, t I discuss that issue and I talk about 1790 when they come back and all of the kinds of indications that Sally Hemings' life changes pretty drastically um, that year from what it had been. What did the, where did the mic go? Oh, there you are. You're, you're pretty, you're stealthy. I didn't even see you. <laughs> Look up. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. I wonder, uh, uh, as you've uh, progressed in your research, uh, if you'd comment uh, on the traditional uh, Jefferson scholarship and the ways in which the issues that have uh, uh, that you've attended to have not come forth in the past. And I, I guess I'd particularly ask about any reflections you have on the work of Dumas Malone. Um. Well, this was a difficult issue, you know. Um, Duma Malone's work, I mean, you, if you're gonna write about Jefferson, you have to go to him because it's all there. Not, well, not everything is there. But I, I don't even mean in terms of this. I mean, it, there's just, the thing about Jefferson, people who work, it, I mean, there are people here who work with the papers, I'm sure. There is so much material. He had so many varied is interests. He had his hand in all these different things. You could write a 23 volume biography of Jefferson. That's why everybody says, you know, Jefferson and slavery, Jefferson and agriculture, Jefferson and, I mean, you could do that. You know, with all, I mean, Malone said he was six or seven men rolled up into one. And you could have all these kinds of biographies. So there are lots of things that are missing from B Malone, not because he didn't, not because it's not a good effort and it's not a good book, it's just that the man and his interests and talents was so immense and so many different ways to, to, to write about him. Um, so I use Malone quite a bit. In my first book, I use him 
uh, in this book, when you're not arguing with people, just because you disagree, I mean, because you disagree with someone, I would never say that someone's work is worthless because you disagree with them about something. There's, there are some points that are very, very good, and there are some points where I think th that are not so good. Um, you have to think that Malone came up at a particular time. We, we tend to think that because Malone chronologically was closer to Jefferson, that that meant that that generation of people understood that time better. I don't think that's right. I think the Civil War and Reconstruction galvanized the white South in a particular way. It made them, it, they were not like they were before. I mean, the, the Thomas Bell story that I'm telling you about with Mary Hemings, this man is living on Main Street with an African-American woman and having children with her. He's, he's made a justice of the peace. They have a committee to decide whether or not they should bring public education to Charlottesville. He's on that. He's a respected figure. I don't believe that a, wh a white man could live with a black woman on Main Street in Charlottesville in the early, in the 20th century, in the 1920s, and hold those positions. I mean, some, the, the, the Civil War changed people because they were out of control. You know, in Jefferson's time, it was no question who was in control of society. And when you were in control, you can afford to be magnanimous, right? You can afford, you get this vigilante stuff when people are insecure, not when people are secure. So Malone grew up in Georgia. I had, a, when I was working on the book with Mr. Jordan, I went down, I interviewed lots of people who knew him, and I went down to talk to Griffin Bell, um, who was an attorney general under Jimmy Carter, I believe. And he had said, oh, I can't wait to, you know, I've I read your book, I've written this article about Jefferson and Hemings, would you look at it? And so I, I looked at it, and it was, it was great. But what he said, he said, you know, I grew up not far from Malone, and I don't understand why he thought this was such a weird thing. He said, because we all knew that this kind of stuff happened back in, the, in, the, in that time period. So I think that it was just a gen we, I mean, we think, as I said, you, it's, it's wrong to think that because he's nearer to Jefferson's time that he would be better suited to do this. I think that generation of people was probably the exactly wrong group of people because he grew up at a time, this was against the law. It was against the law for white people and black people to marry in Virginia to 1967. Um, and they just had the, the anniversary of, of Loving v. Virginia uh, last year, obviously. So um, I think that he was, obviously he was a good scholar, but I think that this was an issue that was very, very hard for him and his generation to, to handle. Um, and it meant, well, attaching too much significance to it. Because to me, um, the thing that I've always wondered, and no one has really given me a satisfactory answer to this, is you know, when, I t when I see stories about like the faucets, what happened to the faucets, um, there's Jefferson in 1813 negotiating the sale of, of a three-year-old girl. Um, he doesn't go through with it. But that that could have been sort of in his contemplation, a three-year-old, right? <laughs> I mean, the things that we accept as normal in slavery and the things that we, my mother used to have this expression, you know, gagging at a gnat and swallowing flies. You know, you, this is something that bothers people, but all these other things that are just, just really endemic to that system that were really, really horrible in comparison that we just kind of accepted. Um, the other thing for Malone, I will say, is that scholars are helped by the works of others. And there has been a revolution in slavery historiography in the past 40 years. It is the crown jewel of American history, really. I mean, the, the names, you know, Edmund Morgan, Winthrop Jordan, John Hope Franklin, C. Van Woodward, all these names, uh, David Bryan Davis. We have learned so much more about the institution of slavery than Malone would have learned in his years as a graduate student. So Phil Morgan, the wonderful book, uh, Slave Counterpart Point, about the development of slavery in the Chesapeake. You know, I really mind that book. Just great sources. So you, you're enriched by the work of other people. And as we go along and people do more scholarship, those kinds of things are available. The Civil Rights Movement certainly changed attitudes about the way you write about black people. Black people are human beings in scholarship now, and they really weren't um, full human beings in the past. They were just sort of like the flora and fauna here. And 
I think there was some embarrassment about Jefferson's ownership of slaves. I mean, Malone was what you would call, in his own way, sort of like a Southern liberal, right? And I think that there was discomfort with writing about Jefferson in this part of Jefferson's life that was less admirable than all the other things. But we understand now, I, I hope we understand now, that you can, you know, that you can celebrate Jefferson's accomplishments, undoubted accomplishments. So they, they had this television program that was, we were supposed to pick the greatest American, you know, and it was one of those things that I shouldn't have said yes that I would do. But, f you know, unfortunately, Jefferson didn't make the cut. I think Elvis and some other people were in there. <laughs> I think, I think, I think Reagan won out, but I was, I was on the team to go and argue for Jefferson as the greatest American. And if I could, I, I could do that, understanding the flaws, but understanding the importance in the other ways. I didn't get a chance to make my, my pitch. Uh, but I think we are at a time, we're more tolerant of this time period of people who have flaws and understanding that flaws don't mean that the person is worthless. Like I said before about scholarship, just because I disagree with someone's scholarship doesn't mean that I say, okay, now don't read Malone or don't read Merrill Peterson or don't read those people. There's valuable, the Jefferson Image in the American Mind is a great book. I just didn't like what he said about the way he treated the Madison Hemings story, but it's something that's useful otherwise. So that's my view on scholarship. People do the best that they can with what they have. And history is the best available information you have at the moment. And um, that is, you keep that in mind and things keep getting rewritten. And I, I understand that definitely. So that's how I feel about it. This person. Hemings. No, you know, that, that is something that is puzzling to me. Martin Hemings was Sally Hemings' uh, well, Elizabeth Hemings' oldest son. And he was the butler at Monticello for a number of years. He's the one I said who faced down the British when they were at Monticello. And he quarrels with Jefferson and demands that Jefferson sell him. And Jefferson says, okay, I'll sell him to whomever he wants. Let him find somebody. I'll take whatever price, just, you know. And then he just sort of disappears off the rolls. And I don't know whether it's that he died or Jefferson just let him go, because he did that with a young man, Jamie Hemings, who was beaten once, and he ran away to Richmond. And Jefferson writes to the guy who found him and says, have James come back. And James says, I'm not coming back unless you agree to me, agree that I don't have to be put under this guy again, the guy who beat him. So Jefferson says, OK just come back. And so James says, okay, I will come back, but I want to go visit my uncle who also lived in Richmond. And then he goes and they never, you know, he's the next time they see him, he's on a boat going up the James river. Um, and Jefferson basically takes him off the roll. He comes back to Monticello. So I'm wondering if that something like that might not have happened to Martin. If he died, you'd think that there'd be some reference to that. I think he may have just been let go. Burles. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You talk about being tragic. Do you know the, st the, the tragic story about her and how she never inherited the property from her Aunt Critter? Yeah, Aunt Critter, yeah. Because that, that's an interesting story. Did you talk about that in the book? Oh, what, what, I did, what I neglected to say or I said in passing is that this book ends in 1831 and I'm going to pick up with the second volume, because this got to be too long, and Norton said, we cannot have a thousand page book, Annette. And I didn't want a thousand page book. So I'm gonna pick them up in, the, in, in 1831 and go forward from there. And you um, emailed me some years ago when you started writing this book. My name is Calvin Jefferson. Mm -hmm. I wanted to send this to Betty Brown. Mm -hmm. And I have some information I really wanna share with you after the session on um, the Colbert family. Okay, I'd be ha well definitely be in touch with me because I'm gonna, as I said, I've already started right now, but I really want to follow this thing, follow this thing through, and um, uh, then get to. Well, I'm actually working on the Jefferson biography at the same time, but definitely uh, contact me. The only thing, I mean, he ends up. The story, as the family tradition is, that he promised Sally Hemings that her children would be free. If you think about it, 
it's, it's really interesting to think about the difference for slavery for women and for men. I mean, even during that time, women, had expect, pe women were expected to care for family and so forth. And I would think it would be very hard to think of, for a woman, to think of leaving your mother and your siblings and your sisters behind. I mean, the, the story is that he promised that, you know, she would have a good life and her children would be free. He later on agrees with James, he gets James to teach his brother Peter to be a chef, and then he frees James. And so, well, James thought, I know. Well, if for James, the other, the, the complicating thing about James is that Jefferson was supposed to come back to France. Jefferson came home on a leave of absence. And so there was every expectation that James was going to come back to France again with Jefferson. For Sally Hemings, it's much more stark because Jefferson wanted to get his daughters out of France. I mean, he really thought, you know, they're growing up not being an American. So for Sally Hemings, coming back home was a much more drastic thing than for James, who could have expected to come back. Jefferson is asked to be Secretary of State, and so then they had to come to some sort of reckoning at that point. But for her, I think it would be, you know, your family. I mean, she could have made, you know, people ask, could she have made a life for herself in France? Uh, people did. I mean, the enslaved people who took their freedom, they became um, matrons of hotel. Actually, French people preferred African, uh, well, slaves of African descent. Uh, she would have been, she and her brother would have been much sought after as employees. But, you know, to think of staying away from your family may have been too much for her. Or maybe she thought, you know, the truth is, I t sort of think of, if, if not Thomas Jefferson, who would Sally Hemings have ended up with? Looking at her sister's life and her mother's life, the odds were always great that she would have ended up with a white guy. And as white men went, he might have been as good as any other um, at, at some point. And so, I mean, that, that, no, seriously, I mean, if you think about, think about the choices women have at that time period. I mean, all women at that moment, they, they depended upon men for their livelihood. And if he made a good case, and if you're 16 years old, and if it's a charming person, and he's rich, and other people like him, it might be easy to convince a 16-year-old to do something like that. I mean, we sit here and think, heck, I'm not, I mean, you know, I would stay where I was. I think what people ask me, well, what should have happened? I think the best thing that could have happened if, you know, you know, if, if it, if the best thing, none of these people would have known each other because we wouldn't have had <laughs> slavery. But as a better matter, I would have said, if Jefferson had said, look, this is a better society for you. You two stay here and work with Mr. Short who was his secretary, who remained in France, work with Mr. Short. If you want to come to see your family, I will let you come to see your family. In my sort of fantasy world, that's what I wish had happened, but it didn't. So um, the thought of, this was always a problem for enslaved people. Do you run away? Do you stay and face whatever you're going to face with your family? And some people ran away, and some people thought about it and just couldn't do it. So. There are lots of things. I mean, I talk about this. I have a whole chapter where I discuss this to try to figure out what is going on here uh, with this person, with these people who decide um, that they will take their chances instead of you know, staying someplace where they could have made a life for themselves. How soon is, uh, do, they have a, do they have an oral history about what happened? Um, th their oral history is that Jefferson loved her and told her that, and that's why she, she believed that. Uh, and that's why she, that's their oral family history. They do have reunions. I went to, I, I don't get as much involved with the contemporary people. I pretty much live in the 18th, in the 19th century. Uh, they're not, they're interesting and fine people, but that's not really my focus. But that's the oral history of, of what this was about. This was, I mean, you know, that that's what he, he conveyed to her, and that's what she believed. So, this one behind us. Um, this. My sense of it is that, just like we have a contemporary example of Essie Mae Washington and Strom Thurmond, that the family sort of really did know that there was a relationship and there was um, the paternity issue there, um, because 
to me, the fact that the story endured, the oral history endured, and the Hemings themselves, I've met some of the descendants, visually, you, you know that they are definitely mixed race. Um, had they been of a darker hue at the time, and Sally had been, if the children had been of a, of a different hue, mm -hmm. one would question whether Jefferson could have been the, you know, the father of the kids, and they look very much like him, and from some accounts that I've read. Don't you get a sense that something, there's this unspoken relationship between some of the, the Jeffersons or the, the extended family and the Hemings and the way in which they're treated, and even perhaps in the community afterwards is when they become free people of color, that they're possibly treated a little bit differently than some of the other folks? Well, you know, this is a question. People all, well, did his daughters know? Did other people know about any of these kinds of relationships or any of that? I think families know these kinds of things. Families know what's going on. We don't talk about the things that happen in our family to outsiders, but it'd be kind of hard for the neighbors to be talking about this, for it to be in a newspaper, for people not to at least question, you know, what is going on here. And I don't, I think it's very hard for us to visualize these families because they're so weird. They're so different from, I mean, imagine owning your relatives, you know, owning your half sister or owning, you know, a nephew, owning, and that, the, the thing that to really convey is that this was not, this is not a, a, a unique, this is not a weird story. I mean, they have done um, sort of spot DNA checks of, of African-American males in different communities. And in some, 45% have European Y male chromosomes. And it's not like the Genghis Khan family where they had, you know, Genghis Khan and his brothers were you know, sort of lording it over everybody. These are different Y chromosomes. I mean, this is not a unique situation. The genetics are pretty tell telling about, uh, about that. So I don't think, it's not that people didn't talk about it. They just didn't talk about it in their letters. And historians rely upon letters. And oh, I never forget one of the first trips I took to Monticello. Uh, they were talking about the narrow staircases. And this person said, the guide said, well, there's no evidence that Jefferson ever went upstairs, meaning there are no letters where he said, I went upstairs. And I'm sort of standing there thinking, no, wait a minute. <laughs> he lived here for all, he never, you know, he had this wonderful eyeglass that kept breaking in the, in the, um, the glass in the window in, in the rotunda that kept breaking. And I'm thinking, he didn't go up to find out you know, what was going on with that piece of glass and why it kept breaking. He never went 50, he never went upstairs in his house because there was no letter saying, I'm going upstairs today. Um, <laughs> historians rely upon letters. And so if they don't talk about it in the letters, then it didn't happen. But that obviously can't be it. I descend from a family that, well, the person who freed my ancestors wasn't important. Uh, historically, and his children ended up being slave owners, and they were treated very differently at the time when you talk about uh, Sally ending up on the register in the 1830s where they had to identify who they were and how they, were, they gained their freedom. My ancestors were exempted from that. They never appeared up until like the 1850s. And what I'm saying is somewhere in the community, in the 1850s, the explanation was this guy was freed by someone well known in the community, and that sort of excused him. It, it was explaining why after you know, nearly 20 years, he had never been forced to register. Well, and that's what I'm wondering oh, yeah. if you see no, evidence no, of that. Nothing other than the fact that they were pretty much left alone you know, uh, in Charlottesville. I mean, somebody really needs, there's a book called Israel on the Appomattox um, uh, by Mel Ely, who talks about Prince Edward County. And he goes through and he describes how, you know, law on the books is one thing. But law, the way it operates in society, people ignore stuff. People do pretty much what they want to do. And folks need to do that. Somebody needs to do that for Albemarle County. And I have to do a little bit of it for my second volume and for the biography of Jefferson. But there are all kinds of stories like that where people, people who are listed as, people are buying and selling property and there's no record that they've ever been freed or whatever. It's just communities can decide to do whatever the heck they want to do depending upon how they feel about certain people. If they like you, that's good. You know small town community. If they don't like you, then it's gonna be hell. So, you know, other than just the fact that all of these people end up, Peter Hemings, uh, Sally Hemings, all those people end up listed as free people even though they were not formally freed, so it indicates that people just kind of let, you know, anybody associated with Jefferson was sort of left 
pretty much alone, not just the Hemingses, but, but all of them. Mm -hmm. Do you, well, there's one, you can take one more. I, that's it, people have to go home, you have trains to catch, whatever. No, you don't, you, you drive, right? I'm from New York, everybody's trying to catch the Long Island Railroad at this time. And Annette, uh, Annette has agreed to, to autograph copies of the book for those who have purchased one, is that correct? That's uh, oh, absolutely correct. My question is not so important that anybody should stay for it if they have more important things to do. But I, I have wanted to ask you, what is your uh, understanding of why the uh, Jefferson's white grandchildren were so uh, opposed to allowing for the truth of this story? They must have known or at least uh, suspected, since they were grandchildren, that, that the liaison existed. Uh, as you say, neighbors knew. Everybody knew, other people within the, in the Monticello community knew. Why was it so important to them, given the fact that we know that it was not uncommon to have that sort of arrangement in the South, and given the fact that the Federalist uh, electoral dirty politics about it was long in the past, why continue so vociferously to deny it, uh, to the point where I would say it seems that perhaps they were deluding themselves? What's your explanation as a as a historical psychologist for that. A historical psychologist, my new hat. Because in the year 2008, there are people who believe that if he had an affair with Hemings, it diminishes him. In the year 2008, people believe that, right? That somehow he wrote the Declaration of Independence, he founded the University of Virginia, the Statute for Religious Freedom in Virginia, and the Library of Congress. And Library of Congress. <laughs> all of those accomplishments, all of those things, I mean, the writing, um, all of that somehow would be destroyed because of this. That's about America, and this is about America's attitude. And they were smart enough to understand that if people had believed this, if people had accepted this in 1826, he would never have been on Mount Rushmore. He would never have become the man, the honored man that we have today, because that is the thing. If this is true, then it means that Jefferson was this horrible person. I don't believe that at all. I wouldn't be standing up here. I mean, I, I don't find that at all. So they understood their countrymen, and they understood what, what was required in order to get him safely through this. And what was required for them was to say that it was Jefferson's nephews who fathered these children. So this is out of love for him. I mean, Thomas Jefferson Randolph would have stepped in front of a bullet for his grandfather, and Ellen would have as well. And if you, when you love families, I mean, this is the great thing about family. Um, we love one another, we cover for one another, and we try to protect the family. They understood that his legacy depended upon destroying this. And the fact that people today, after all that we've learned, still believe that this would destroy all of his contributions to us, they understood that. So that, that's my answer. We're not over it yet. And so I, I, I don't understand the, the, the notion. I mean, if, as a private matter, I can understand the family, you know, because, you know, we have our families and we have our boundaries and we don't want other people in it. I, I get that point. But the idea that this would destroy the legacy of, of a great man is just unfathomable to me. So thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.